My name is Jeremy. I'm one of the pastors here at Port City Church. And I'll just say this at the outset. If you are here and you don't have a Bible, you're like, okay, you told me to open up my Bible and I don't have one. We actually have Bibles for you guys on your way in. You see there's a box of Bibles. Uh, You can grab one of those every single week and you can actually keep it. It's yours, especially if you don't have one. We want that to be a gift for you guys. All right, let's start just with a little visual today, okay? I don't know if this has ever happened to you before. But back at our old house uh, in North Carolina, uh, occasionally, actually I should say frequently, uh, one of the sinks in the bathroom would get clogged up. And so inevitably, you know, Julianne would come to me and she would say, you know, hey, the sink is starting to get clogged. Again, one of the joys of having three daughters, there's, there's a lot of joys to that. One of the downsides is there's a lot of hair. And so she would say, you know, hey, the, the sink in the girl's bathroom, uh, is, it's, it's getting clogged up again. I'm like, okay, I'll take care of it, no worries, I'll deal with that. And, A week would go by and two weeks would go by. And eventually she would come and she would say, hey, listen, like they're in there brushing their teeth. Like the the water is literally not draining. Like it's now a pool in the sink of like gross, like toothpastey water, you know. And so inevitably I would have to go and and get underneath the sink and, and kind of undo the pipes. And anyways, you can imagine what that looked like, okay. I say that to give us a visual of what Jesus is showing us here in Luke 10. Our life is not to look like. Jesus is showing us here that our life as followers of Jesus is not to be a container that holds the gospel. It's not to be a container where the gospel stagnates in our life. But rather, our life as followers of Jesus is to resemble more of the pipes underneath where the gospel flows. So what I want us to do is we read Luke 10 and we begin to unpack and study what Jesus is doing here in this passage. I want us to just evaluate Does our life look more like a conduit for the gospel to flow through, or does it look more like a container that's just kind of just self-sustained? And the reality that we're going to see is that the gospel has come to us in order that it might flow through us. And so I just want us to do a quick evaluation. Is that what our life looks like as followers of Jesus? That's what we want to kind of analyze and unpack. Does our life as followers of Jesus look like that pipe that the gospel is flowing through? So the big idea for our time today is is, is just simply this. The gospel saves and it sends. So over the last several weeks we've been talking about this idea that the gospel saves us. So we know that. Like the gospel saves us from our sin. But that's not the only thing that the gospel does. The gospel as we're going to see here in Luke chapter 10, it sends us out. So for the follower of Jesus, it's a both end. The gospel saves and the gospel sends us. There's another important thing, I think, for us right at the outset. Look back at verse 1 real quick. It says this in verse 1. After this, the Lord appointed 72 others, and he sent them on ahead of him, two by two, into every town and place where he himself was about to go. So it says here that Jesus is sending out this group of people called the others. Now, we flash back to Luke chapter 9. In Luke chapter 9, Jesus had actually already sent out his 12 apostles. Now, if that's all we had, if the Bible only showed us Jesus sending out his 12 apostles, here's the danger with that. The danger with that is we would be tempted to think that this idea of living on mission, that being engaged for the gospel... Like, that's just for the professional Christian. Like, if all we saw Jesus doing was sending out the apostles, we think, well, yeah, of course he sends out the apostles. Like, they're the professionals. Like, they're the ones that are supposed to do the work of the ministry. They're the ones that are supposed to live on mission for Jesus. But now, in Luke chapter 10, we have this group called the others. You're like, who is it? Well, these are just normal followers of Jesus. These are just disciples that have chosen to follow Jesus, and yet Jesus is here, and he's sending them out. Here's what that means for us. As we look at this passage, one of the things that we realize is that when we talk about engaging the mission, one of the reasons that we say every single week as we close out our service, we say, hey, Port City Church, you are sent out. The reason we say that is because the reality is being on mission with Jesus is part of the everyday normal Christian life. So we see the others being sent out. They're they're normal Christians. Jesus is sending out Christians because that is what it means to live out the normal everyday Christian life. It's just part of the culture, if you will, of being a follower of Jesus. When we moved here, one of the things that people kept talking about all the time, they kept talking about snow tires. And I was like, wow, this seems like it's an important thing because many people kept asking, like, when are you going to get your snow tires put on? 
well, in North Carolina, we don't do snow tires. And so I was like, I better look into this. And so I, I realized that one of the things that you do when you live in Canada is that you, you go and you get snow tires on. And I was very thankful the first time that we were driving our kids to school in the middle of a snowstorm. And I was very thankful that I had to make the decision to put on snow tires. Here's the thing. Snow tires, it's, just, it's part of the culture here, right? Like it's, just, it's part of what we do when you live in a context where there's a lot of snow. And what Jesus is showing us here in Luke chapter 10 is living on mission for him is it's just part of the culture of following Jesus. And so what that means is, no matter where you're at in your journey with Jesus, whether you've been following Jesus for a week or whether you've been following Jesus for an entire lifetime, what Jesus is showing us here is that being, engaging the mission is not something that you add on later. Sharing the gospel, living in terms of seeing the kingdom of Jesus come forward, that is just part of the normal everyday Christian life. So if being on mission with Jesus is, is, is normal for the Christian, then here's what I want to do with the rest of our time. I want to look at, okay, well, what exactly is the mission of God? When we talk about engaging the mission, when you say to me every single week, Port City Church, you're sent out, what does that actually mean? And Jesus is going to show us right here. He's going to show us by way of giving us a problem, a promise, and then he shows us a plan, all right? A problem, a promise, and then we're going to unpack his plan. So let's look at first the problem. Jesus shows us a problem in this passage. Think about this for a second. When we read, when Josh read Luke chapter 10, did you find it interesting that Jesus' prayer is not focused on the harvest, but rather it's focused on the laborers? Jesus is saying pray for laborers. He's he's not necessarily saying pray for the harvest. You think that's, that's interesting because what Jesus is saying here is he's saying my prayer is, it's not so much for people that don't know Jesus, it's, it's actually for the church. It's for people who, who know Jesus. You think, okay, why is that the case? Why is Jesus having us pray in this way? One of my favorite pastors, his name is David Platt. He said it very pointedly. He said this. He said, Jesus' concern is not that the lost will not come to the Father. Jesus' concern is that the church will not go to the lost. It's a stinging statement, but the issue is not that there's not enough people who don't know Jesus. The issue is that the people that do know Jesus are not going and telling those who don't know Jesus. So Jesus is pointing out the problem here. Jesus here is telling these followers to go, knowing that oftentimes the problem is that when we're told to go, we we don't want to go, we want to stay. (laughs) When we're told to go and engage the mission, we're kind of like, no, I don't know, I kind of want to stay. And I think there's several reasons that we can unpack, but I think there's two reasons in particular that are probably common to most of us here as to why it is that we don't engage the mission. When Jesus says, hey, I'm sending you out, there's a couple reasons in particular that I think keep us from being sent out, that keep us staying instead of being sent. One of those is the idol of control, and the other one is the idol of comfort. Now, just a quick refresher when we think about idols. Remember, an idol is anything that you give more weight more attention, more love to in your life than God. And oftentimes, these are not bad things in your life. More often than not, these are good things, but these are good things that we have turned into God things. And so you think about control. Control is not a bad thing. Comfort is not a bad thing, but these are things that we've given more weight in our life than God. So think about, for example, the idol of control. For many of us, we have a deep fear of not being in control. We want predictable outcomes, We want to know in our life how things are going to turn out. I know this is true of me because of how many times in a given day I check my weather app. You know, I think, why is it that I need to check the weather app eight times a day? Like the weather is not, even in Atlantic Canada, the weather is not changing that frequently. Why is that? Well, it's because like me knowing what the weather is gives me some small sense of control in my life. It's not wrong to know what the weather is, but the reality is I'm going there because it makes me feel better when I know, because it makes me feel like I'm in control of my life. I thought about this week as we were on a plane flying back from North Carolina. You know, one of my favorite things to do is to pull up the screen and to put the map to show us where I am in, in, my, in the flight. And I remember thinking, like, why is it that I love so much to follow and track where, where the plane is going? And I started thinking about it. You know, I was like, it makes me feel like I'm a little bit more in control of this plane when I know exactly where we are and how long it's going to take us to get there. I mean, there's no more helpless feeling than getting on a plane, right? Like, you get on a plane, you're like, well, I hope that guy or girl knows what they're doing. 
But me staring at that map, it gives me some small sense of control in my life. Like, like I have a grip on this. The idea of control, oftentimes it makes us want to know. It makes us want to know, look, if I make the decision to follow Jesus, like I, I want to know that I'm not going to have to give up all the things that I love in my life. The idol of control, it makes us want to know. It makes us want to know, okay, you know, like Jimmy was just saying, if, if you're telling me to give my money to the church, I, I want to know that if I give my money to the church, that, that I'm, I'm going to have enough left over to pay the bills and to spend money on things that I want to spend money on. Or, or like, okay, it, it, the idol of control is, it's one of those things where it's like, I, I, I want to share the gospel, but I, I want to know that if I share the gospel with someone, it's not going to be a total flop. Or if I invite my neighbor out to church, that it's not going to ruin the relationship. And the idol of control keeps us from doing those things because we want to know and have a predictable outcome. But the reality is that control is an illusion. And that's actually a good thing. It's an illusion because what the Bible shows us all throughout is that God is in control, and that's good because God is good. So maybe there's some of us that we can identify with that. We struggle with the idol of control, but maybe it's, maybe it's the fear of losing our comfort. I love what C.S. Lewis, one of the great Christian writers, he said this. He said, I didn't go to religion to make me happy. He said, I always knew a bottle of port would do that. He said, if you want a religion to make you feel really comfortable, I certainly would not recommend Christianity. C.S. Lewis knew what we read last week in Luke chapter 9. Jesus said it very clearly. Luke chapter 9, verse 23, Jesus says, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. See, oftentimes we want to follow Jesus. We want to follow Jesus to the degree that we know that it won't interfere with my hobbies or my money or my retirement or whatever it is that we want in terms of our lifestyle. The irony is that none of those things, they will actually deliver the comfort that we actually go to them to find. Jesus is telling us that when you go to those things, they're not bad things, but when you try to build your life on those things, Jesus is saying that's a faulty foundation. I don't know if you guys saw it in the news a few weeks ago, down in Utah, there was uh, a week where there was a ton of snow melt, and as a result of this snow melting, there were certain houses that were built on a foundation that was a bit unstable. And so there's videos of these houses, nice, beautiful, large homes. Literally, the foundation is falling away, and these houses are collapsing over the side of a hill. Jesus, he teaches us that when we build our life on comfort, it's no different than building our life on that type of foundation. That eventually our life will crumble and and fall apart. So let's just be honest with ourselves today and just ask us, do we struggle with one or more of these idols? Is one of these idols at play in our life? I think about the idol of control in my life. I think about how for so long I struggled with the call to be a part of planting a church here in Halifax, Nova Scotia. The reason I struggled with that was because I liked my life. It was safe and secure and comfortable and it was predictable. And I didn't want to mess that up. And so what I had done over my time in ministry in North Carolina is I had kind of just grabbed the things that God had given me in my life. And I had just put a death grip on them. And it took nine years for the Lord to begin to just pry my hands open to the point where I said, God, I realize that none of this is in my control anyway. It's all yours. So let me ask you, does the thought of not knowing how something is going to turn out? Or does the thought of giving up something in your life that might be comfortable, does that make you afraid? Does that make you worried? Does that make you angry? Those are signs that maybe we are struggling with one or more of these idols in our life. So before we can rejoice in the promise that we're about to look at, or before we can engage with the plan that Jesus is going to show us, we have to first repent of the idols that keep us from being on mission with Jesus. So that's the problem. But what's the promise? What's the promise? That's the second thing. Jesus is going to reveal to us this promise. Before he sends this group of 72 others out, what he wants them to be very clear about is he wants them to know what his father's heart is. He wants them to know what is the mission that God is sending us on. So you say, okay, I get it. I realize that that 
being a follower of Jesus, part of the normal everyday life of following Jesus is being sent out. But what exactly are we being sent out for? I hear you talking about engaging the mission. What exactly is the mission? Look back at verse 2. There's that little phrase in there where Jesus says, the harvest is plentiful. Jesus is revealing to us the heart of his Father. What Jesus is saying there is that there is a massive harvest. A harvest of what? A harvest of people that God desires to draw into relationship with himself. A harvest of people that are far from God, that God desires to be in relationship with him. Last fall, my parents were up visiting, and so we thought, you know, it would be fun to take them out to the Annapolis Valley, and it was a Thursday, so we knew that things would, you know, not be very busy, and so we went to one of the uh, apple picking farms out there in the Annapolis Valley, and, and we're out there, and there's, there's like no one out there. And so we're standing in the middle of this apple orchard, and I just remember looking around, I remember thinking, there's four of us, and there are like thousands and thousands and thousands of apples, and to get a picture there of what Jesus is talking about here, there are, the harvest is plentiful. Thousands upon thousands upon thousands of people that God desires to draw into relationship with himself. That's the Father's heart. That's the promise that we have when Jesus sends us out. God's desire is that people would be free from their sin and drawn into relationship with him. Jesus is reminding us that God is not He's not a tyrant who's up in heaven ready to squish us under his thumb for our sin. That's not the heart of the Father. The heart of the Father is his desire to bring people back into relationship with himself, to give them meaning and purpose and value to restore all things in their life. But the thing is, this is not a surprise for us. In fact, this is what the Bible shows us God's heart is all throughout. So let me give you a few verses that maybe you can go back at this week and just look at just to see what God's heart is for those who are far from him. Here's what it says in Ezekiel 18, 23. God says, have I any pleasure in the death of the wicked, declares the Lord God, and not rather that they should turn from his way and live? Or take Psalm 67, 1 through 2. It says, may God be gracious to us. Bless us. May his face shine upon us that your way may be known on the earth, your saving power among all nations. Or 1 Timothy 2.4 says that God's desire is that all people be saved and come into a knowledge of the truth. So let me pause for a second and let me just talk to maybe some of you are in here this morning and you say, you know what, I, I, don't, I don't have a relationship with God. You'd be honest enough to say that you're not a follower of Jesus. Let me just say that there are, I know, a lot of reasons in our life that we could say we don't follow Jesus. Maybe for you, you grew up around the church. Maybe you even grew up in the church. And maybe one of the reasons is, you know, you said, I just had a really bad church experience. Maybe it's that you've known Christians in your life and you're like, I just don't want to be like them. <laughs> There are reasons in our life that we can say, you know what, I, I just don't want to follow Jesus. One of the reasons that you can't say is that God doesn't want a relationship with you. Because what Jesus is showing us here in Luke 10 is that no, God definitively wants a relationship with you. The harvest is plentiful. God desires to be in relationship with you, to give you hope, to give you meaning, to give you purpose. I believe that maybe there are some today that need to see and believe that the promise that Jesus gives those that he's sending out is the promise that he gives you. He desires to save you. But maybe you are a follower of Jesus. Let me ask you this. When you think about your friend or your coworker or your neighbor, is this promise that Jesus gives that he desires to draw many into relationship with him, do you still believe that about that person in your life? Or have you kind of maybe come to a point where you're a bit cynical, you've maybe given up hope? Isaiah 59.1 reminds us, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, nor his ear too dull that it cannot hear. The harvest is plentiful. That's a promise. The Father's heart is to draw those in the harvest back to himself. So would our prayer today be, God, make my heart that of your heart. Now, one of the great things is that Jesus gives us this promise, but 
The promise involves us, like he uses us. God just doesn't sideswipe and say, okay, I'm just going to do this myself. God says, no, I am going to use you. That's why I said at the outset, the desire that God has for our life is that we would be a conduit for the gospel, not just a container of the gospel. So in God's sovereignty, he chooses to use us to live on mission. And we see that the harvest is plentiful, which means that there's a lot of work to be done, which is why God gives us a plan. Jesus gives his disciples a plan. Before he sends them out, he says, here's the problem. Let me remind you of this promise, but you're also going to need a game plan. All right, so what is the game plan? Well, the game plan first, it starts with prayer. Look back at verse 2. Jesus says right at the outset, pray earnestly. Pray earnestly. So the first thing that we're reminded of here is that prayer is never an afterthought to the mission of God. Prayer is primary to the mission of God. I think sometimes in our life we kind of think of prayer as like, that's like secondary. Like we'll get to that after we do the real work. And what Jesus is saying here is no, prayer is the work. Like before you go out, pray. So the plan that Jesus gives his disciples, it starts with prayer. Now I think it's interesting when you begin to do a little study of church history, you realize that every great revival in the history of the world always starts with prayer. Several months ago, I was spending some time with my uncle. He's actually a pastor over on PEI, and, and he was telling me about one of the revivals that I wasn't very familiar with. It was the revival that took place, actually one of the last great revivals that took place from 1949 to 1952, and it took place in the Hebrides Islands over in Scotland. It was super interesting because he was saying, you know, this revival, actually, you can trace some of what we see uh, in the Maritimes. You can actually trace it back to the revival that took place in the late 40s and early 50s. Some people that were greatly influenced uh, there uh, actually kind of imported the revival over here into the Maritimes. And so I began to do a little research, and I began to look up, well, what, what exactly took place? And I found this interview that someone had done with one of uh, the women that was around during that time. And she was well off into her 80s at this point. And I thought this statement that she made was, was incredibly striking. She said this about the revival in the Hebrides Islands. She says the revival was marked by an attitude of brokenness and desperation. It was a spirit of necessity and audacity. Listen to this, a manner of prayer that could be daring and agonizing. We talked about this a little last week. You think about the nature of prayer for a second. Like, like just pause for a second. Let's just think, okay, what is prayer? Like, like, why is it, or what are we doing when we pray? Really, I think prayer is an admission of the only thing that we bring to the table. We talked about this last week. The only thing that we bring to the table to God is need. We don't bring him our good works. We, we don't bring him our morality. We don't bring, no, what we bring to God is need. And so when we pray, essentially that's what we're doing. We're coming before the Lord and we're saying, God, I recognize that I am who I am and you are who you are, and I'm bringing you my need. I need you for what? Everything. Prayer is that acknowledgement. It's our acknowledgement of our dependence on God. It's saying, God, we can't, but you can. Prayer is putting into practice this theological reality. We need God to change our hearts because, listen, on our own, we want comfort and control. Like on our own, we don't want to engage the mission. So we need to pray and say, God, I need you to give me that desire in my life. So what's one of the first steps to living on mission with Jesus? Jesus says, pray. <laughs> you want to learn how to live on mission for me? What do you do? You, you pray. Pray that God would use you. Think about this. What if you prayed that prayer for the next 30 days? What if we began to say, okay, God, I want to live on mission for you, and we started with just prayer. And we said, over the next 30 days, I'm just going to pray that simple prayer. God, would you use me in fill in the blank? Maybe it's your workplace, maybe it's your home. What could God do if we just start there? But then God, Jesus goes on in this plan, he says, okay, you need to pray. But then he also shows them that their, pr- their plan involves word and deed. Look back at verse 9. This plan involves word and deed. Jesus says, heal the sick in it. He's talking about going to these cities. He says, when you get to these cities, heal the sick that are there and say to them, the kingdom of God has come near to you. So why is Jesus saying heal the sick? 
What Jesus is saying there is, hey, you're going to go and you're going to talk about the kingdom of God, but you're also going to bring signs of the kingdom of God. So he says, you're going to go and you're going to heal the sick. Why do you heal the sick? Because Jesus is saying, in my kingdom, especially in my kingdom, fully realize one day there will be a kingdom where there is no sickness. So you think about that. Why is it that we, as a church, want to be a church that helps people in need? Why are we as a church, wants to, why do we want to help people who are hungry? Well, we want to help people who are hungry because we're showing them signs of a kingdom where there will be a day where there is no more hungry. Why is it that we, as a church, want to be a part of helping people who are hurting? Well, we want to not only tell them about the kingdom of Jesus, we want to show them that there is a kingdom where one day there will be no more pain or crying or tears. So Jesus is telling his disciples here, as you go out, not only tell them about the kingdom, but, but show them what it's like. Don't just tell them, show them. So I grew up in Philadelphia, and someone once told me, they said, man, it's not a sermon. Uh, it's not one of my sermons if I don't tell you I'm from Philadelphia. So probably every other week you're going to know that I'm from Philadelphia. But one of the things I love to do, okay, is I love to tell people about Philadelphia. I mean, I could sit down with you for hours, which would probably be the most boring thing in the world, and I could just tell you all about Philadelphia. But here's the thing. I would rather show you Philadelphia. Like, I would rather say, hey, let's jump on a plane, and let's fly to Philly, and let me not only just tell you what Philadelphia is like, but let me walk you around and show you where Benjamin Franklin is buried, and let me show you where, you know, I spent my childhood, you know, watching Philadelphia sports, and and I I would want to take you all around the city, not just to tell you what it's like, but to show you what it's like. Jesus is telling his disciples as he sends them out, he's saying, look, don't just tell them what my kingdom is like, but show them what my kingdom is like. So if you're a follower of Jesus, are you living in a way that is showing people around you what Jesus' kingdom is like? Yes, let's tell people, but let's show people. So you ask yourself this, does the way that we treat others when we are mistreated show people the kingdom of God? Or think of it this way, does the way that we handle stress and difficulty in life, does that show people the kingdom of God? Or the way that we spend our money or spend our time, is that showing people the kingdom of God? The way we work and the way that we serve others in our workplace, is that showing people the kingdom of God? Jesus' kingdom is is better than any kingdom that we can build here on earth. And so Jesus says, show them, don't just tell them. So the plan involves prayer, it starts with prayer, it involves word and deed, but then Jesus also says, hey, the plan, this is urgent. This is an urgent thing. Look back at verse 4. It's an interesting instruction that Jesus gives his disciples here. He says, carry no money bag, no knapsack, no sandals, and greet no one on the road. So you're like, I'm not, what's going on here? Is Jesus telling them to be rude? No, Jesus is not telling the others to be rude as they go on their way and just not talk to anybody. What Jesus is showing them here is that the mission is urgent. There's not time to delay. Like, don't have casual conversation on your way. The mission is too urgent for you to be stopped, for you to be distracted. Jesus is saying, essentially, that he's saying, look, your your good intentions aren't going to carry the mission of God forward. Your obedience is. I throw my dad under the bus here. I love my dad. I told you last week, you know, I one time loved him so much that I tried to tell my friends that he went to prison. Um, so my dad, he, he was a guy of his word, right? Very much a man of his word. And uh, so when he said he was going to do something, uh, he always did it, except for one thing. He promised us when we were kids that he was going to build us a treehouse, you know? And I remember around age 17 going back to my dad and being like, Dad, I think you don't need to worry about the treehouse anymore. I'm a little bit old for that now, you know? Now, he did fully make up for it. And uh, he, built my grand- uh, he built his grandkids an awesome treehouse uh, at our last house. But, you know, well, I think about that example. I think, you know, my dad, it wasn't that he didn't intend to build us a treehouse growing up. Like, he very much had intentions, good intentions, to build us a treehouse. But the reality is, his good intentions didn't build the treehouse. I think for us as followers of Jesus, sometimes we get kind of caught up in having good intentions, but the reality is our good intentions don't move the mission of God forward. Our obedience does. So we have to ask ourselves, are there things in our life that maybe God has called us to do that we have just put in that good intention category? 
And realizing this, that God is, he's not after our good intentions, he's after our obedience. He's not after our good intentions, he's after our obedience. This is why one of the values for us as a church is that we would engage the mission. It's that important for us to not live good intention Christian lives, but in response to what Jesus has done for us to live obedient Christian lives. So maybe there's something in your life that you've been putting off maybe for a month, a year, 10 years. Maybe it's serving someone in need. Maybe it's a gospel conversation with a neighbor. Maybe it's a missions trip. Maybe it's talking to a pastor about a struggle that you have. God is not after your good intentions. He wants you to be obedient in those things. So Jesus says the plan is is urgent. We have to act on it. Then he also says the plan is risky. The last thing he shows us here is that the plan is risky. Look back at verse 3. Jesus says, Go your way. Behold, I am sending you out as lambs in the midst of wolves. Jesus here, he's, he's setting expectations. I've told you guys before that one of the things that we do on long car rides is that we have an expectations conversation before we start the car ride because I've realized that if I don't clearly outline what I'm expecting on this nine-hour drive, that I will be thoroughly angry. (laughs) So my wife will say as we get in the car and we start the car and we're like, okay, here we go. We're going to drive to whoever. We're going to take this, you know, four, five, ten-hour car ride. What are you expecting the next ten hours to look like? And I've learned that I can't say I'm expecting for us to have beautiful, long conversation where we plan out our future. (laughs) I'm supposed to say that I expect to have 20-minute, at best, interval conversations where we maybe answer about one question. So we're setting expectations, and that's what Jesus is doing here. Before he sends out his disciples, before he sends out this group of others, he's saying, hey, I want to make sure you understand what to expect. And so Jesus, we realize he's, he's never vague, he's, he's never ambiguous, he's never unclear about what it means to follow him. We just said that in Luke chapter 9. Jesus is super clear. This is what it means. This is the cost of following me. And just so we're clear here, a quick animal kingdom lesson, wolves eat sheep. <laughs> so Jesus is saying, I'm sending you out as lambs, as sheep among wolves. To which if you're sitting there listening, you're, you know, you're one of these others, you're thinking like, mm, I don't, that sounds dangerous. And Jesus is like, yes, it is. It is dangerous. Wolves are dangerous. But here's the thing I think sometimes that we get caught up with. I think sometimes we think, as followers of Jesus, we think that risk, like, like, okay, it's going to be a risk for me to live on mission with Jesus. I think sometimes we look at that as a one-way street. We kind of think of risk as a one-way street. Here's what I mean by that. I think we think, okay, if I share the gospel with my coworker, I'm going to maybe risk losing that friendship. Or I'm going to risk It being awkward between us. We think about it this way. You know, think if I choose to be part of that church, I'm going to risk giving up the time that that maybe I have to do other things. Or or you think maybe if I choose to confess that sin or admit this struggle that I'm going to, that I have, I'm going to risk my reputation. I don't know if I want to risk that. So we think about risk as a one-way street. The reality is that risk is, is never a one-way street. Because here's the truth of what the Bible helps us to see. When we choose to live stagnant instead of living on mission with Jesus, we risk wasting our life. Risk is never a one-way street. Yes, there are things that we risk when we choose to live on mission with Jesus, but what Jesus is showing us here is if you choose to not, the other risk is that you risk wasting your life. So it's not just your relationships or your time or your reputation that's at risk. What's at risk is you not walking in the good works that God has prepared beforehand, like Paul says in Ephesians 2.10. Those are the things that we risk. And the reality is that you will have to stand before God and you will have to give an account for why you chose one risk over the other. So Jesus says the plan, it starts with prayer. He says it involves word and deed. It's urgent. It's risky. And when Jesus sends out the others, when he sends out the 72, here's what Jesus is not promising. Just to be super clear, Jesus is not promising that when you live on mission with him, it's going to be easy. In fact, Jesus says, no, it's actually going to be pretty hard. Jesus is not promising that if you live on mission with him, it's going to be safe. Remember, wolves. No, he says it's actually going to be pretty unsafe. 
He's not promising that if you live on mission with him that it won't come at a cost. He says, no, it'll, it'll cost you everything. Here's what Jesus is promising. He's saying that living on mission with him is worth it because he's worth it. And he says he's worth it because he was reminding us in John 10, he says this. He says, the thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. But he says this, I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. Jesus says, it's worth it because I'm the good shepherd, and the good shepherd goes with the sheep. That, yes, these things I want to be super clear with you about, that it is hard, and it is at times unsafe, and it, and it will cost you, but it's worth it because I'm the good shepherd. So living on mission with Jesus means going out among wolves, but we go with the assurance and the presence of the good shepherd. And what we were reminded of is that the good shepherd, he didn't just risk his life for us. The good shepherd gave his life for us. That's the gospel. That is the truth that compels us to engage the mission. But here's the other thing. We realize that the good shepherd, he's not sending us to a place that he hasn't already gone. The other thing we realize is that your worth, your value, your identity, your acceptance in God, it has nothing to do with how missional you are. Like it has nothing to do with, okay, if you do these things, then you will be loved by God. That's not what Jesus is saying here. He's not saying, okay, if you really, he's not saying, if you go out and you engage the mission, then I will accept you. He's telling his disciples, no, you've been accepted, therefore you go. So our worth is not dependent on how many times we share the gospel. Our worth is not dependent on how many mission trips we go on. Our worth is not dependent on how many community service things we've done. Our acceptance as a Christian is not in us going anywhere or doing anything, but rather it's in the fact that Jesus has come for us. And when we get that truth deep down into our hearts, the result is that we want to go, that we will go, that we will engage the mission. Here's another motivation, though, I think, for us as followers of Jesus, and we'll close with this. Look at verse 17. Josh didn't read this part. So let, let's look at this together. Luke 10, verse 17 through 20. So Jesus sends out these others. Now they're coming back. They've done the ministry. They're coming back. It says, the 72 return with joy, saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. And Jesus said, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Behold, I have given you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall hurt you. And then this, look at this in verse 20. Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this that the spirits are subject to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. What Jesus is helping his disciples to see here when he sends out the others, what he's reminding them about so clearly is that he has not sent them out on a futile mission. This is, this is not a vain mission. Jesus is saying, hey, let me remind you what I have seen and what I know to be true. In the end, I win. God wins. This week, my parents were here watching my kids as we were out of town, and my mom was up back in January, and she said, hey, do you have that pair of sneakers that I left here? I said, oh, yeah, I think they're in, in my closet. And so I go in my closet, and we begin to look, and I can't find these sneakers, like, anywhere. And so for the next, like, I don't know, 30 minutes, an hour, we're, like, searching the house up and down. We're accusing my 13-year-old of taking her grandmother's shoes, you know, we're like looking everywhere, like all over the house. I can't find the shoes anywhere. It was driving me crazy. That's because I had taken those shoes the last time I went down to Philadelphia. They weren't in the house. <laughs> they were at my mom's house in Philadelphia, which means I could have searched that house for days and days and days and days, and I never would have found the shoes because they weren't there. What Jesus is saying here to his disciples is when I send you out, this is not a futile mission. I'm not sending you out to something whether you're going to go out and you're going to do ministry and you're going to do all these great things for no reason at all. No, no, you are on mission with me because the truth is, and we see and we look forward that Jesus wins. So when we say as a church every single, way, every single week, Port City Church, you are sent out, what we're sending you out on is not a futile mission. We are sending you out 
with the promise that Jesus gives here that he, he wins. Let me pray for us. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that you have been so gracious that Father, before you send us, you come and you came for us in Christ. Father, you loved us enough when we were far from you. You loved us enough to send your only son, Jesus, God, to pay the penalty for our sin. And God, all, all of our worth and all of our acceptance is wrapped up in that truth. And so, God, we know as a church, we can be about a lot of things. God, we can do a lot of good things. But if we do those good things, God, apart from the fact that you have done the greatest good for us, then, God, it is it's for nothing. And so, Father, as a ch- we want to be a church that engages the mission. But, God, we want to do that because we realize, first and foremost, that you have come for us. Lord, search us out. Those areas of our hearts, Father, that... God, maybe we were just struggling with the idol of control. God, maybe we just, Father, we like those things that are comfortable and they're keeping us. God, maybe they're keeping us from admitting sin. Maybe they're keeping us, God, from sharing the gospel with someone. Father, would you help us to repent of that? God, we thank you that you're a loving God. Your promise, Father, is that you desire to bring many, many into relationship with yourself. Thank you. Pray in Jesus' name.